Hello and welcome to Euro PCR 2025. I'm Chris Cook and in this session we're going to be talking about some of the many highlights that have happened across the structural programme here at Euro PCR. And to help me in that challenge, I welcome to the studio Nicolas Dumental and of course Bernard Prendergast. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks Chris. Thank you. So Nicola, let's jump straight in. What were your highlights from the aortic and TAVI point of view? I think I would say TAVI being now mainstream therapy and uh, with the global experience we have in the community, we realized when we built the program that uh, our, our um, colleagues are facing more and more challenging uh, situations like redo TAVI, difficulty to reaccess the coronary after TAVI, really needing leaflet modification. So we address that in the program, both in the case-based session, in the live case educational uh, sessions. And I think it was a natural link to the Fil Rouge of this year edition, uh, that is just to, to have Euro PCR this year as the place to, sh to find solution um, uh, in face of such complex situations. Yeah, and I think that's, as operators, that's exactly the kind of education and, and thought sharing that we need. So Bernard, now there's a huge scientific element to Euro PCR as well. Could you give us some of your highlights from the research side of, of Structural? No, absolutely. We were overwhelmed this year with uh, submissions, firstly, uh, not only the late-breaking trials, but also original abstracts and cases as well. So the, the volume of submitted research and clinical experience was huge. If I was thinking about individual sessions, we had the late-breaking trials session, and the highlight there from the TAVI perspective was the meta-analysis of the two major randomized control trials addressing the question of cerebral protection as a protective mechanism against stroke as a complication of TAVI. And this is important because in mainstream practice it has become the convention to use these devices, particularly for so-called high-risk patients. So this year we had the second major randomised control trial published, the BHF Protect TAVI from, uh, trial from the UK, coupled with the Protected TAVI trial from the US. And in this pre-specified patient level meta-analysis, we were able to pool data from over 10,000 randomised patients with a very clear message that cerebral protection is not uh, effective in reducing the incidence of periprocedural stroke. So this challenges conventional practice in many centres. It also suggests that we are not as good as we think we are at identifying high-risk patients and it raises many more questions about this element of our practice. So that was a very important practice changing study I believe. I totally agree and the calibre of science is not just practice informing, it's practice changing now and we've seen that across the programme. Exactly. We also had some hotline uh, abstracts just to mention very quickly. We had some very reassuring information regarding five-year outcomes from the UK TAVI trials, surgery versus TAVI. Perhaps a slight signal regarding stroke in relation to TAVI that we need to look into in a bit more detail. We had data regarding new devices coming to market now. And we also have some reassuring information regarding outcomes in bicuspid valve anatomy as well. So a wealth of information for everyday practice. And it fits with that theme of complexity, right? Bicuspid is, is something that we have to treat. Okay, so Nicola, let's now move into the mitral and tricuspid space. Any highlights for you there? Yeah, let's divide it, as you said, yeah, with mitral tricuspid. I would say on the mitral side, uh, it's mainly about mitral edge to edge repair, which is now the most established therapy. And I would highlight here uh, within our program the importance of a simulation based learning program, allowing uh, um, colleagues having low experience but even more confirmed to really understand what they are doing with this therapy and to integrate uh, their technique into anatomical uh, understanding of the, of the patient and also linking that with imaging. On the tricuspid side, I think uh, we, we, what we saw in the program and I what I would highlight is that it's, a, I would say, a more dynamic field where we see a coming well, solution for edge to edge repair, but also new replacement devices and a lot of new devices, a lot of innovations. And we, we really see that field is, is growing and uh, is growing maybe even faster than the mitral side. Yeah, and you mentioned the critical role of imaging in, in guiding and planning these procedures. 
So Bernard, coming back to you for the, the, the last section really, what, what are the highlights from an imaging side of things? Well, I, I think just an emphasis on the integration of imaging into the, the, the structural or the valve heart team. We've known that for a long time, but it's really apparent now at, at this course that the imaging community are here in force and they are making a very important contribution to the way that we think about these procedures, the way that we plan them and the way we execute them. Indeed, just a little vision into the future, I've just been to a session uh, hosted by our colleagues from China, where they are now undertaking structural and valve interventions with echo guidance alone. We don't need a cath lab, we don't need fluoroscopy, they're suggesting. Doing PFO closure, left atrial appendage, mitral tear, and would you believe it, even TAVI under echo guidance alone. So think about it, take it home, digest. This may be the vision of the future. Well, I think we're all trying to reduce our radiation burden. So that's it, an excellent suggestion. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for providing your highlights from the structural program. And really in summary, it's about respecting and understanding the complexity of the practice that we do, but sharing solutions to be able to help our patients. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.